In early spring of 1893, Conard and Agatha Farrenville and their eight children, ranging from 15 years to four months, Steve, Catherine, Vincent, Bernard, Ida, Mary, Anna, and Otilla, of Baden, Germany, set sail across the wide Atlantic to New York Harbor. Three weeks later, in the month of May, well, let's see, April, they got on the ship at Havre, France, and arrived at Ness City, Kansas, May the 15th, 1893. Their destination was the far-flung prairies of western Kansas, still yet the pioneer way of life and their destiny to share. Mr. Farrenbaugh's brother, Florian, a bachelor better known as Uncle Florian, had preceded them to the United States 15 years before, and it was at his urging the family came to America. His homestead was a short distance northeast of Mantina schoolhouse. There was one room sod house, and the Farrenbaugh family came and lived there for some time, the boys sleeping in granaries till Mr. Farrenbaugh bought the relinquished claim to a homestead three miles south, which was to be their home the remainder of their lives. The only building there was a frame house with a loft. They lived this they lived in until the sod house was built, later four-room stone house was built, which is still standing today and which is the, was much lived in. The stone walls of this house were laid by Tom and, and John Fancher. Stones were dug from the hills along Riverside. There were members, Frushes were members of the Pioneer family that came to Hudson. Hodgman County in 1878. The Farrenbaugh's were devout Catholics. Before the St. Ignatius Church of, Nunch of the Nunchalana Parish was built in 1902, one, one mile north and two miles east of the old Nunchalana town. Survivors held in the Farrenbaugh home in the old stone, mass was held in the old stone house. The church was built in 1902 and tore down in 74. It stood for 72 years, and for years the statue, a statue symbol of the Catholic people, not, not only of Ness County, but those of Hodgman as well. The pioneer families of Nick Gable, Gus Govich, and others helped to build the church. Service were discontinued November 1960. Five. The old church served its time well. The ever constant change of life had passed it by. For the next 15 years, it stood as a landmark of the surrounding country. It was named after Ignatius Farrenbaugh, daddy of Florine and Conard. And a 10 year old daughter and sister of the Farrenbaugh family died in 1898 of diphtheria. She was at first buried in the old Nana Cemetery, seven miles south of Ness City, just west of Highway 283. Then four years later was moved and interned in the churchyard cemetery. It was the bells tolled and the ringing of the bell in the steeple balcony that could be heard for miles around. Every noon, Grandpa Farrenball would walk the quarter of a mile to the church and ring the, ring the bell, saying the Angelus. All were supposed to stop working and say the Angelus while he rang the bell. To all the trials and hard work that was the pattern of those days, to the Farrenbaugh family was added problems of short water. Many a barrel of water was hauled from the neighboring wells, and a number of wells was dug by hand, but always the same result very little water until 1916 when a deep well was drilled with plenty of good soft water. This was, was to be found after 23 years held its charm. In 1894, another son was born, Joe Joseph, who, like all the rest, born with the spirit of, that surrounded the, all obstacles, life's challenge to be met 
not to turn away from, which was typical of all the family. Joe is remembered for his mischievous ways. There, three and a half miles northwest of the old town of Nonchalanda, from its days of life, now a memory, with only a grocery store and post office standing, operated by Uncle John and Aunt Judy Wilcox. Between the town and the Farnball homestead was Wild Horse Lake, a large, wide natural depression with no outlet the dry, and dry most of the time. After the big rain, the wide expanse of water would be shallow. Across this water, warm weather, the Farnball children would walk with their shoes off. The wide span weighed in it, walking to Nonchalanta to get the mail. They would leave home admonished by their mother, now don't play in the lake. It was on the winter day that Kate left home to get the mail, walking as usual. What could have been the far-reaching event, by the time she arrived at the old town, it was snowing. Soon the storm began, became so bad, and Aunt Judy would not let Kate start home. Before long, the blizzard was raging, all of such damnation that the that to be impossible for anyone to go searching for her. The family spent a long sleepless night of agony and suspense as to what the outcome would be. By morning, the storm had abated to the extent that Steve rode to the old town on horseback and there found Kate safe at Wilcox home. What a relief had been, but to those at home it was to wait wait until they found their way back. Sometime during the year of 1903, Steve contracted the four years to carry the mail from Nonchalanta to Ness City. This was three days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. During the winter months, Steve started the mail, carried the mail on horseback with the help of Kate during the summer months. When those four years were up, he again signed a contract to carry the mail from for another 16 years. He still rode the route horseback during the winter, and by now Mary was old enough to drive the route with the team. Roads that were only trails, the routes, ruts of which may still be seen in stretches of native grass. On the trails, there were many gates to be opened and closed. To the girls, it give credit, to give credit for the bronco-type horses they drove, western ponies, not ever to be depended on to stand at the gates, but to be driven to a post next to the gate, tied there while the gate was opened, and then untied, driven through the gate, and back the post again while the gates was being closed. This to be repeated at every gate. It was the custom of the times for patrons of the route to ask the carrier while in town to get this or that, whatever it might be. It was at the time of this event that Mary had driven the team and buggy to the west entrance of Hunt's store. Now the B and C variety store, asking Cal Bennett, the, marsh, the city marshal, who happened to be standing there, to hold the team while she went in the store to get whatever someone had asked for. When she came out, the horses were about to get away from him, throwing what she had in her hand into the buggy, grabbed the lines and jumped in just as the horses started to move out. By this time, they were in the street and headed west. They were running at a dead run. The first four years, Steve received $24.50 a month. The next four, $32 and a month. For this, he rode through all kinds of weather, rain and storm. It was on one of these times that he came to near freezing. He had been to, to city on the way home. He came to the home of Bill and Charles Mellis, two bachelor brothers who lived in the stone house 
a quarter of a mile from the road. It was located in the draw southwest the bridge, which is now spans across the Walnut Creek, near where the South Fork office had been some time before, but discontinued. The old tra trail by the Mellis home, when Steve rode up, the trail was near the Mellis, Mellis home, and Steve rode up, Bill came out to the box and asked Steve is cold, to which reply, no, I'm not a bit cold. It's nice and warm. It was a feeling of warmth preceding death by freezing. Bill, not c saying anything, being a big man, he reached for the horse's reins and, and led Steve's horse to the house. He could not stand, but they put his horse in the barn, and all night long they kept a hot fire burning, with Steve sitting beside the wrap quilt, shivering throughout the night. Had it not been for the resourceful thinking of, of, the, of Bill, Steve would have ridden into the wintry snow, and coming darkness would have froze to death, not realizing the, night, the light with de and death were riding near. The walls of the old stone house are still standing as a mark to mark the spot. The Farrenball home being three miles northeast of old Nonchalanta, Steve would ride to the old town, take up the mail, and then to Ness City. He has told me the mornings were not bad, but that the worst part of the carrying the mail was after getting home in the evening to eat supper and change horses, then ride on the old town after dark during the cold weather, after Uncle John and Aunt Judy Wilcox left Wichita, Nunchalanta, <laughs> the post office was moved to the George Slagle home two miles west, which made it more difficult. As the death of any young person is tragic to the grave of the little Farrenball girl in 1902 was added the grave of a young pioneer family mother of three boys who, with her husband, lived on the homestead somewhere in the country near Beeler. She had passed away with the, with the youngest child being three months old and was buried in the churchyard. Can, on the monument was the inscription, Addie White, born 1881, died September the 8th, 1902, at the age of 21 years, gone but not forgotten. Mary Hoss remembers this happening. She told me that Mr. White came and told of the death of his wife and asked permission to have her buried in the cemetery, and that a request that was granted. The Farrenball boys dug the grave. The next day, Mr. White and some of his neighbors came with the body of Mrs. White. It was late in the afternoon when they arrived, and as a priest was not to be had, Mr. Farrenball found the prayers to conduct the graveside services. Mrs. Farrenball had supper prepared for these people, as they hadn't eaten since early morning. So Addie White was laid at rest in a grave that for 55 years the location was but all but forgotten. After the death of Mrs. White, Mr. White, after taking the three boys to Mrs. Slagle's folks in Nebraska, all track of him was lost. Sometime during 1957, a granddaughter came to Ness County trying to locate the grave, but was unable to do so. It was some time later during the 60s, she somehow contracted Mrs. Daisy Thompson of Beeler, who in turn referred her to Mary Farrenbo to Mary Hoss, who was able to tell her the location of the grave of her grandmother. She then came and had placed there a granite monument beside the grandmother. This marker placed there in 1902, a broken dream that goes forever and ever. For many years, a forgotten grave by her people, another example of the price of the prairie. Addie added to their life and hard work was the accident that happened to Mr. Farrenball, which left him 
crippled for the rest of his life. One evening during the month of January, he and Miss Farnbaugh driving a team of horses, his two buggy went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Adolf Beck, who lived just west of Mantina Schoolhouse, to visit as Mr. Beck was very ill. The night was dark. After starting home, they had not driven but a short distance when they crossed the Guzzler's Gulch, known as the Robinson Hill, dating back to 1880, as it was in the wide expand of the Gulch. It was the home of Pioneer Robinson family. It was the girlhood home of Edna Robinson, who never married but devoted her life to educating young people and by teaching in S County schools and several terms of county superintendent. It was here that they lost the trail and due to the steepness of the hill, the buggy overturned, throwing the Mr. and Miss Farnbaugh out. The horses became frightened and broke loose and ran away. Mr. Farnbaugh was injured to the extent he could not move. Mrs. Farnbaugh, uninjured, walked for almost four miles to their home for help leaving Mr. Farnbow lying on the ground. Steve had to hitch the team to the wagon and drive back for Mr. Farnbow. As luck would have it, the night was, wasn't too cold. Had it been cold, it would have been a different story. But it was cold and, and Mr. Farnbow could not reach the blanket and lie on the cold ground in pain. As it was found upon examination, of the doctor, his hip was di dislocated, an injury which he never recovered. He walked on crutches and a built-up shoe the rest of his life for 28 years. It was the Robinson Hill, as decreed by fate, that an incident happened that placed the life mark on the face of a young girl. The Farnborough children were going to Manhattan driving one horse team cart till he was sitting in in front of the seat and going downhill the horse kicked hit, hitting her in the right cheek leaving a scar the shape of a horse's hoof years later a large stone barn was built the rock and work was done by Bert Prose and a member of the Pioneer Prose, a member of the Pioneer Prose family in the loft of this barn many an old time dance was held, and people came for miles around to dance to the fiddle music of Sam Pitts and Raleigh Price, and perhaps other old-time musicians. To Ben, we write a little line of regard of ability to ride horses. Joe and Walstall, pioneers in the late 1870s who lived northeast of the Mantina schoolhouse, owned racehorses. They had a training track just east of their home. Ben, as a young boy, rode their racehorses. Sig Spangler, one of the pioneer Spangler family who had a ranch near the Pember schoolhouse in Ness County while other Spanglers settled on the Pioneer Creek in the Hodgman County. Mr. Spangler also had race horses and training the track. The scar of the west end of the trail may still be seen in the grass at the eastmost edge of the George Copeland's pasture. It was here that fleet-footed horses ran to be trained for the racetrack under the guiding hand of Ben Farnball. I will remember one incident that happened later while my brother Arthur and I were attending the Pember School, which was a short distance from where Ben Farnball family lived at that time on the old Armstrong place. We had started home riding double on the black horse. It was bitter cold and was snowing and blowing. When we rode by Ben's home, he ran out, stopped us, and said, I'm afraid you kids to ride home in this storm, which was about two miles across the prairie. He said, wait until I get a horse. I'll ride with you. He went into the barn and as to match the Simster occasion, led out another black horse, which when he mounted without a saddle, began to buck. 
while Ben, apparently unconcerned, still confident of his ability to ride horses, rode the two miles to this to a safe way home for two cold boys. Then with inside of our home said, you kids can make it now, turn and like a phantom figure, the horse and rider disappeared in the whirling snow to the cold ride home. To Ben and Ethel families, tragedy struck the 8th of September, 1907, when Harold, their firstborn child, died during a night by choking to death with a croup. He was 11 months old to the day. This happened while they were living on a homestead up in the hills, five miles west of the Zilke farm. And another grave of tragedy was added to the churchyard cemetery. On August the 30th, 1933, Steve and Ella Farrenball were to no heartbreak <coughs> and tragedy of their third son, Melvin, Joseph Melvin, who died by drowning in the stock tank to the cemetery, another grave of tragedy. This story of many pioneer names all seemingly to revolve around the Farrenball family so much for the life of hard work and tragedy, but a more dramatic, colorful, or talent display of courage to meet the time of the moment and which the difficult, to be difficult to find like tragedy stage each member of the family as the players stood in wings ready to perform their parts, all waiting for their clue to make the way of life. Its years progressed. All the children married, raised their families, and lived their lives almost within the shadow of the old home, with the exception of Joe, who after marrying moved to the far way Washington State. There lived and passed away. Now to you, the many descendants of the Pioneer family from cultural heritage across the sea to that written you have bought, but not without price, your heritage. May you ever be proud by Ted Copeland, Mess City, Kansas. January 1976, in writing these lines, I am indebted to Mary Farron Hoss of Ness City for much of the Philian, and to Louise Fresher Starlet of Dodd City for a letter written with the thought of this word, thou why not write the Farrenball story. Recorded by Otilia Hoss. <laughs> <laughs> now give the date. June 1976.